Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. I have on the show today the one and only Dr. Cutter Calloway. Uh, Dr. Calloway is Associate Professor of Theology and Culture and Co-Director of Real Spirituality. Uh, he's written a ton of books. Um, the most recent books are Techno Sapiens in a Networked Era, Becoming Digital Neighbors, um, The Aesthetics of Atheism, Theology and Imagination in Contemporary Culture, Deep Focus, Film and Theology and Dialogue, and uh, the book that I read um, that really uh, introduced me to Cutter and his work was uh, Breaking the Marriage Idol, Reconstructing Our Cultural and Spiritual Norms, which I absolutely highly recommend. It's an incredibly great book. In this podcast, we talk a lot about the theology of film. How should Christians watch film? How do we think about the meaning of different movies and uh, television television series. We also wander into a conversation, uh, the content of his book, um, about singleness and marriage and masculinity and femininity and men's retreats and women's retreats. Cutter is a delightful person. You're really going to enjoy this episode. So without further ado, let's get to know the one and only Dr. Cutter Calloway. All right. Hey, Cutter. Welcome to Theology in the Raw. Appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, I, we were just chit-chatting offline. Uh, for those of you watching the YouTube version of this, uh, here is the book that uh, the first is this your first book you wrote or first at least popular level book or. Uh, yeah. For, uh, yeah. First popular. I think it's my third or fourth book. OK. But, yeah. Uh, it's in there. Yeah, You dance in between kind of popular and academic stuff. So, uh, yeah, I mean, most most of my academic stuff I'd I'd like for the general public to read um so i do a lot of stuff in like pop culture yeah tv film that sort of stuff and if if you make that unreadable it's kind of, i don't know what the yeah. point is so right uh, but, but, but still i i'll do the philosophy theology thing sometimes and it gets a little heady so yeah yeah well, i want to get into the content of this book and then probably go many different directions but for those who don't know who you are give us a snapshot of uh who you are your journey and what you do Sure. Um, well, I my day job is I'm on faculty at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena. Um, I'm the I'm an associate professor of theology and culture, um, which basically means I get to if you add the and after theology, you get to do stuff that's fun. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the things that I find interesting and, and enjoyable out there in contemporary society, I, I kind of look at that and go, well, what's God up to there? Um, and let's explore it. So that's that's sort of the gist. Um, mm. More recently, I've been uh, I uh, I just completed a, a second PhD actually in psychological science. Um, Are you so serious? I've been, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, and the reason is because I'm I'm really interested in the sort of uh, psychosocial effects of media, of oh, wow. of art, of, of TV, film, etc. And then to go, you know, what's what's happening psychologically for people. How can we maybe get at that and then think through um, how might God be up to something in the way that we're responding uh, in, in, in and to those different forms of media? So yeah. that's sort of my research and my teaching and all that stuff um, is what I do. I've got so many questions about that. Uh, so but before so the theology of culture, theology and culture, you do a lot of stuff with like theology of film, right? Like you, act, you actually assign movies for homework for seminary yeah, courses. Yeah. Um, again, I mean, this is why, you know, th my strategy in life is just pick stuff you love and find a way yeah. to get it part of your job. So yeah, my real yeah, question I mean, is, how did I miss that boat? Like, <laughs> where exactly. did I go wrong? Yeah. So I assign, I assign, uh, I have a TV course and a film course. Um, so in the TV course, you have to watch like 30 hours of television, uh, <laughs> the, the film course. And it, it's funny because in both courses, the the students, you know, they'll they'll cry uncle not for the reading, you know, like there's a lot of reading in these master's level courses. It's the amount of TV or film. It's like Cutter, ah, two movies a week, like come on. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just I'm just giving you more free time to you know um, do some entertainment. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's usually what the classes are, and um, the goal is really to uh, think through um, one, how do we become better interpreters of of culture, of society, of the world. Um, and, and having done, uh, given a fair hearing to, uh, these sort of cultural artifacts, mm -hmm. um, then responding from the sort of core of our, our faith in part, because, um, you know, in the last, let's say 40 years in at least us Christianity, um, there's a tendency to sort of respond first <laughs> and think second. 
Um, yeah. You know, you get all the classic things of, you know, boycotts of films that nobody's ever seen. Uh, or, you know, and it's like what, yeah. these screeds yeah. that are articles about some horrible film. And it's like, wait, oh, the, the author of the article never even watched it. And it's like, wow. Um, yeah. So so that's the worst case. But but even in between there, um, we're just consumed with consuming. Right. Uh, yeah. And. And, and yet we're not very, and by we, I mean uh, this subsection of, of Christians in the U.S. aren't incredibly well-equipped or skilled at actually interpreting what these various art forms mean. <laughs> um, and so that's a big part of, of kind of what I do, of like, how do you go through and, and take a film or a TV show on its own terms um, before uh, responding theologically or, or Christianly? Can, can you give us some examples? I'm for the... For... I'm super interested in this as a conversation. I'm, I'm just known very yeah. little about it. I've got, I've had a couple of friends that have kind of dabbled. One of my buddies, Mark Vivian wrote a book on kind of like theology of music. And then um, I had a part-time teaching stint at Nottingham university and they had like a theology and film course. I remember being like, didn't have a category for that. So I always talked to that professor. So that's the extent of my knowledge, but g give us an example that maybe of a favorite movie or maybe low hanging fruit on what does it look like for a Christian to evaluate yeah, a, a film, TV series more thoughtfully. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I just got off uh, a, a Skype interview with the director of a new film coming out, so this is just top yeah. of mind. Um, this one's a little on the nose because it's it's a film called uh, The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Um, uh. And it's uh, uh, Jessica Chastain plays Tammy Faye Baker, uh, and uh, Andrew Garfield is, is Jim Baker. And um, it is really interesting because everybody on the project, nobody is a Christian. Right. And they're telling this story of kind of a, a seminal moment in recent evangelical uh, yeah. <laughs> narrative drama, um, drama that really yeah. paved, you know, paved the way for kind of where we're at right now on a number of issues. Right. Um, and your podcast is, is one of these. I mean, like her her advocacy, for example, for LGBTQ folks is really interesting. And the, the movie paints this really interesting mm. picture of how she was kind of. Um, exiled or really just bracketed out of the conversation. Um, and the way this movie uh, tells it is in part because it was a strategic political move, not necessarily a theological move. Um, it was, you need to go sit down and shut up because that's not a part of our strategy, right? So anyway, yeah. um, so let's take this movie, okay? So you can come at it from a, a number of different ways. And, you know, a Christian could come in and go, ah, oh, you know, Hollywood's just uh, just hates Christianity and doesn't understand us, and they're going to make this movie to to uh, basically criticize and condemn us. Um, but if you actually <laughs> watch it as a movie, um, you'll and and allow it. So this is sort of a, a C.S. Lewis quote. His uh, in his interpretation or his uh, uh, what's the book? Um, uh, Method on interpretation. Ah, I can't remember the name of the book, but his his quote is. Um, Anytime you're coming to a, a text, uh, and he's talking about literature, but film it, it would apply as well, is to um, the, the first gesture is to stop, uh, listen, and receive. Get yourself out of the way. And what he means by that, I think, is to let the art kind of do its work um, before sort of prejudging it. Um, and so if you do that with this film, what you realize is actually it's a really pretty sincere take <laughs> on yeah. these characters and these people. But what it what it exposes is something that's kind of difficult, I think, for us to um, to engage. And so part of it is to go, OK, what's the film actually doing? And then the next thing is, um, well, what what then do we make theologically of it? And then also, what do we make sort of missionally of it? So what does it mean now that major Hollywood actress Jessica Chastain is super passionate about the, telling this story? Like, mm -hmm. why are they wanting to tell the story? So. So there's all those different levels of there's the, the text, like how do you interpret it just as an artifact? Um, there's the sort of theological, like how do I make sense of it as a as maybe a source for inspiration or meaning in my life? And then there's to me the sort of missional imperative of like, how does this give me uh, language or categories to engage a broader society that often looks at us like, you know, uh, in us being the Christian community um, as if we're kind of crazies, right? Like yeah. <laughs> they, they were very foreign to them. And so how can it be a sort of a bridge to have conversations about God, about spirituality? Um, so that's just one example. Okay. Um, but but basically, any movie that comes up, I, uh, you know, my notion of how God's present in the world is, any of it is an opportunity to think uh, to think about how do I build bridges to other people, yeah. and how might God be speaking something to my life in and through it? Can you give us a, a, a movie that most people are maybe familiar with, and 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 kind of 
do what you just sure. said we should be doing with, well, with movies? Um, maybe I don't want to use a negative example. I was going to say maybe we just go into the book with the Disney princess movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, actually. Um, so one question I've got is the, and maybe this will be a good segue is, um, the Disney sort of uh, world um, universe, their cinematic universe. Um, is you know popular with all these princesses, and we have most recently um, the Frozen characters, right? Mm-hmm. So Frozen Two is now well, maybe it's man, I don't. The pandemic has made me lose time, so I don't know. Maybe it's <laughs> two years old now. But um, there's this really interesting, and I've got uh, three uh, young daughters. My oldest actually just today turns eleven, oh, wow. so eleven, nine, and 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 almost six. Um, and so they know Frozen, right? I mean, I've <laughs> most of my parenting has been Frozen based. <laughs> Um, and so, but Frozen 2 is really interesting, um, and Frozen 1 as well, in terms of how it deals with, for example, marriage and, and singleness and whatnot. But Frozen 2, you get this really interesting thing where, um, Elsa is, is being like called, have you seen it by the way? I've not seen Uh, Frozen 2. Oh, okay. I, I'd recommend it. I really enjoy (laughs) it. I think musically it's actually superior to Frozen 1. I I might've been in the room when the movie was playing, but I don't. I'm not yeah. going to recall the narrative. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so early on, Elsa, um, the the ice princess uh, lady, she she's basically called by this voice, by this or not even voice. It's like a it's a song, right? And she's she's being um, summoned to to kind of respond to this call that she can't quite articulate. Um, and one of the main songs is uh, "Into the Unknown," right? And she's saying, like, "I've, I've, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I've done my adventure. I'm, I'm, I'm set. I'm, and I'm settled. But I can't deny this, this voice that's calling me to take this risk. And the risk is, I'm stepping out essentially on faith into unknown, uncharted territory. Hmm. Um, and I'm looking at this going, uh. <laughs> Are you all like Christians? Like who's writing this stuff? Right. Um, Because and what was fascinating, I so I use this. So we do this stuff at Fuller where it's kind of uh, prospective students come in and they're like, oh, you know, so forth, so on, you know, give a little spiel and say, here's why you should come to Fuller. Um, And I'm the film guy. So I use this example. And and I said the same thing to prospective students who are looking at like, where is God moving in my life? Do I need to pursue further education? Do I need to go to a, a different uh, business? Uh, in a Should I pursue pastoral ministry? Mm-hmm. I am a pastor. I want to go to do something else. And, and they're considering maybe graduate education is part of that process. And so my whole spiel, I played, <laughs> I played that song, Into the Unknown, from Frozen 2. Um, and I basically said, hey, uh, I'm guessing most of you are here because you sensed something calling you into an adventure or a risk that you can't really articulate. And maybe your family and friends are even saying you're crazy, but you know you're not. Um, and I'm here to tell you, you're not crazy, right? Um, but it's a risk, right? Um, the, if, if anything, seminary <clears throat> used to be a thing where we prepared people for like really predictable and stable places that they'd land. Um, and now I say like, if we're, if the seminary is doing its job, we're preparing you for a world that doesn't exist yet. Okay. So I did that little spiel. I want to say February of 2020 (laughs) and little did I know, um, everything was about to like blow up and it's now we're like in this perpetual state of unknowingness, right? Like what's cut? We don't know. Um, and so I just, uh, both in the way that a film like that, um, can offer, Um, some categories that um, aren't necessarily Christian or biblical or theological, um, but they do what I call is reverse the hermeneutical flow. They um, they can give us some language or or visions or images that then we go back to our own uh, tradition, our own texts and go, well, Hmm. what if we thought about the spirit at work in the world in these terms? Um, How does that change the way I think about the Bible? Um, Mm -hmm. And and vice versa, how might it be um, new language for a new time? Um, And can we listen to the the prophets, the artists of our day to help us think through those things, especially when we're encountering um, these sort of dynamic upheavals in in the world? Well, how do you explain? Yeah, no, (laughs) no, absolutely. I just, it just, just, all these other questions pop in my mind. The the biggest one I've had um, is how do you explain it when a Totally secular movie created by secular people create a narrative that has some pretty 
aggressive kind of Christian themes? Is that the Romans two four? Is it general revelation? Like, what's the theological category of that? Yeah. Um, uh, for me, yeah. Um, uh, and I would, uh, you know, there's uh, my uh, my theological mentor, a guy named Rob Johnston, uh, wrote a great book called God's Wider Presence. Huh. Um, and he does a lot of stuff with film as well. And it's it's general revelation. It's like a reconsideration of general revelation. And the reason it's a reconsideration is because usually or often when people talk about Romans or these other places um, that we would we would go to, um, it's a it's sort of like uh, a cup half empty sort of thing. It's a, huh. yeah, okay, maybe God can be discerned in, in, in creation, but you know what? We're so scarred by sin, it's essentially worthless. Or they go to um, to Romans uh, 1, where it's, if anything, it just holds you under judgment, right? Like the <laughs> best thing it can do is to remind you how you stand condemned before God, yeah. um, you know, all of you heathens. But it misses <laughs> Romans 2, where it says, um, uh, you know, where the, the sort of we have been written or the law has been written on, or wait, is that Romans two? I may Romans, be mixing Romans up. Two, yeah. no? Romans it two, 14, 15. The law has been written on their hearts such that, um, uh, the Gentiles will be accused or excused. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a weird, Whoa. it's a weird phrase. Yeah. What? <laughs> no, that's not, no, that's not what Paul means. No, <laughs> Paul just means accused. Right. So, um, but, so there's stuff like that, but then also you broaden it out to to me the God's water presence thing is is, uh, and again I I should know more about your listenership. So uh, if I say pneumatology, I just mean uh, yeah yeah uh, the spirit how God's spirit how we think of the spirit right, um, and so less about Paul and more about like where are all those sort of biblical texts where we see God's spirit up to something at work mm. and specifically outside of the covenant community. Mm. Um, and there's all these really interesting narratives when you start framing it that way, um, that, that you go, okay. Um, one of my favorite stories is, uh, uh King Josiah mm. meeting <clears throat> Pharaoh Nico, um, at the end of his life. Um, so Josiah, you know, King of Judah, one of the good Kings, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, he's there's two times in Chronicles and in Kings that the story is mentioned, and it's only in one where this bit of the story comes up. And um, it's fascinating. So the, the king of, of Egypt, the Pharaoh, Nico, needs to get through uh, Judah, needs to go through the land, comes up to Josiah um, and says, hey, I've got no bit with you. I need, just need to cross through. Let us let us go through um, and, you know, peace be with you, brother. <laughs> um, and and Josiah is like, no, you're you're Egypt, right? Like, I'm not going to let you just walk through our land. Now, again, Josiah is the good king. He reforms mm -hmm. Judah, right? He, he got rid of all the. So if anybody knows what's up with what God's doing in the world, it should be Josiah. Mm -hmm. Well, King Nico, it's really fascinating, says, um, you know, uh, Elohim. So God, mm -hmm. uh, the sort of not the Yahweh covenant God, but Elohim has told me to do this. And, and he says to Josiah, um, let me through lest you be in opposition to God, right? Um, don't oppose God. And, uh, Josiah does goes down, meets him in the battle. It gets killed. Um, yeah. and it says Josiah died because he did not heed the voice of God through King Nico. Huh. And you go, Whoa. Um, so yeah, there is biblical huh. precedent for saying, there are moments, lots of moments, where God is speaking and acting and moving outside of the the people who own God, right. and 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 we need to pay attention. And when we don't, um, mm -hmm. it's consequential. It's hmm. and I actually think we're in a in that moment right now of going, um, you know, my read. I don't know if we, you wanted to talk about all this, but my read of the <laughs> the whole <laughs> biblical sort of narrative could be summed up in basically. The people of God over and over forget what it means to be the people of God. <laughs> so God sends them people who aren't in the community <laughs> to remind them. Um, and that's just it. Oh, we keep forgetting. And 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 so now we have all of these. And I would consider, you know, certain filmmakers and and artists to be the prophets of today, recalling, calling the people of God to a faithfulness that we've forgotten hmm. Um and it's very easy to just disregard them and say, no, no, that's a film or that's a that's not a Christian. That's not a representative. We know what God wants. We know what God's up to. How dare you suggest, you know. Um, and I just think that's a that's a pretty flawed uh, uh, approach. And and we see what happens to Israel and Judah. Um, yeah. And so the question is, 
are we willing to, to hear those voices? No, that's, that's powerful, man. Uh, hey, friends, I want to invite you to come out to the Theology in the Raw conference next spring, uh, March 31st through April 2nd. It's here in Boise, or you can live stream it. Early bird registration ends on September 30th, okay? So you get a discount if you register before September, well, before October 1st. Uh, if you're coming out to... Um, attend the conference live here in Boise. All the information is on my website, PrestonSpringfield.com. Again, if you are planning on coming out, you definitely want to take take advantage of the early bird registration, which is about to end. Voices. No, that's that's powerful, man. Um, I'm curious. I just have so many movies going through my head, and like as I've tried to like do what you're suggesting we should do, you know, really look in and through uh, these movies, and not just as just raw entertainment. Although, there, I mean, there are some like. Yeah, just those action flicks that are just—they're just blowing <laughs> stuff up for two hours. Yeah. You know, uh, what was the Fast Fast and Furious like nine or something that just came out? <laughs> <laughs> like those are kind of just for raw entertainment, right? Would you say? I mean, there's, yeah. maybe oh, yeah. there's something yeah. there to. What about? I'm I'm just I just wrote down a few that off the top of my head seem like man, there's something really rich here. Um, and I'll let you pick which, if there's any that you're like, oh yeah, I would love to kind of dive into that. Uh, Joker, Get Out, oh. Gran Torino. Mm-hmm. And then TV series, Stranger Things, Walking yep. Dead. Yep, yep. Okay, so <laughs> I, I confess I've not seen The Walking Dead. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I should. It's one of those that it took off before I got a chance, and now there's too many. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually have a book called The Aesthetics of Atheism, and the whole first section's on Stranger Things. Okay. Um, and it's basically uh, <laughs> a, a, a take on the horror genre, Mm -hmm. as essentially theological. Um, And then at the end of each section of that book, I sort of reinterpret uh, Mark, the the gospel of Mark through, through that lens. So if you're interested in stranger things, but um, yeah, Joker. So, um, uh, and then on the film side, um, uh, would you say Joker and Uh, get out out and uh, Grant, Grant, Grant Um, that's another one. I should have, there's being a movie guy, I realized <laughs> I just I just thought this is like yeah. <laughs> Yo, no, yeah, I the the problem is there's literally more media created now than yeah. there are hours in a year. So oh, every wow. like you, you literally can't watch it all. So yeah. I ha- I have to give yeah. myself a break. So that one I haven't seen. But yeah, I mean Get Out's a perfect um a, a perfect example and um is actually in my most recent TV book if you want to uh, oh. it's called Deep, Deep Focus and okay. we talk a bit about uh, Get Out. But that is a great example of um, one of the many. I mean, like one of the things that I would say, uh, if you have a, a robust notion of God's spirit is Get Out's not the only one. I mean, there's like movie after movie after movie now, TV series after TV series, article after article, book after book, all very loudly saying um, uh, we are we being African-American uh, people are living through a horror film hmm. um, and you're the, you're the terror right <laughs> um, and and that is a really important word for anyone who is white or from any sort of dominant culture um, to hear it's also very easy and as I observe specifically like white Christians it looks like mm-hmm. um, we have a, a very easy defense mechanism um, where, we we want to say no. That's not our thing. That's not our problem. Um, yeah. And I think uh, to your point, get out is a, a great example of saying um, we need to sit and stare at that movie and all of its horror um, so that it affects us. Yeah. Um, and you know uh, they're painting with really big brushstrokes <laughs> to sort of like get our attention. Um, and if we're if we haven't habituated ourselves to film and TV in this way, um, it's very easy to dismiss it. Um, and it's very easy to dismiss yeah. all of these voices, either because of who the authors are, right, or what the kind of medium it is. But man, that is an s- incredibly important film mm-hmm. um, that everybody should see. Yeah. Uh, here's, what, here, here's why I brought that one up. First of all, I, I thought it was a really powerful film. I... I with all the kind of race films out there, I, I become less impressed when they're too clean and neat and binary. You know, you have like 
white conservatives are the bad people and then you know mm-hmm. the progressives are good or whatever like what i liked about get out is it and like other ones i could think of you know or, or like you know i i i like i really do like um the hate the hate you give you know yeah. Uh, yeah. but that yeah. that and and it, it was it's it's a great i think it's great um but it is a it, it you know white cop does this whatever like we're very familiar with that narrative and we need to be um what i liked about get out is here you have what i would consider more like white progressives you know <laughs> um who actually want yeah. they they these aren't slave owning they like no they want the black a black body body I mean, we're gonna spoil it here i guess you know but even or even yeah. like they're talking about obama like oh i would have voted for him a third time you know like they were yeah. <laughs> and, and what i yeah. like is it's like no this is not just a Oh, if you're conservative, you're the bad person. If you're liberal, you're good. You know, it's like, no, it's way more complex than that. Am, am I right oh, to read it that way? Like, I feel like they just stirred the pot to where nobody's really comfortable watching that film. Oh, yeah. In a good abs- way. Abs- absolutely. And that's, that's, that they're leveraging the best of the horror genre, right? Like, they, <laughs> no matter who it is, they want you to be rattled, right? Yeah. Um, but you're absolutely right. And, and from what I hear now, this is then gets then beyond the film of conversations. Um, of uh, is as I you know continue to try to grow and learn in this this realm myself, um, I've heard repeatedly that um, white liberals are sometimes the worst. <laughs> yeah. Um, and 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 because they are sincere and you know um and and yet um are sort of perpetuating or um reinforcing some of the very systemic problems Hmm. um that uh you know black and brown bodies are suffering under and Mm -hmm. and that's a problem and so to think you're kind of like off the hook because you're you're a woke uh white progressive um (laughs) isn't enough and so i think you're absolutely right that part of the benefit of that is it doesn't it doesn't paint in (laughs) black (laughs) black and white that's uh (laughs) let's see uh it doesn't paint in in binaries right yeah Um, i i've heard it i've heard it compared to like the well-meaning old school kind of white missionary to Africa. Yeah. You know? So it's like, yeah. man, they're, they're literally giving up their life buying a one way ticket. Yeah. Why? Because these people need help. Like they, you know, yeah. it's like, it's very almost colonial, like belittling, is- stripping people of agency kind of a posture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, now again, th- and even that doesn't, that also doesn't let off the hook, you know, conservatives. No, either. but I feel um, like but- that's kind of low hanging fruit, at least in my world. It's like, yeah, yeah the, January yeah. six people or what you know it's like of now, course another, like <laughs> another one um, I think more recent yeah I think it was more recent is uh for example like uh Black Klansman right um I don't know if you saw that one, no the Spike Lee movie yeah yeah great um or um and it's <laughs> it's over the top and in your face and yeah. some people were really troubled by it um I I believe it came out the same year this is maybe 2 years ago both were up for Oscars I want to say um was Green Book did you see Green Book No Um so both were critiqued for almost opposite reasons Green Book um and and both for the the historicity of these things right <laughs> Um and so you get critiques Green Book came off um where it essentially it seemed on the surface like it was a film that was advocating for and supporting this, you know, a brilliant black musician. Um, and at the end of the day, the movie itself kind of reinforces that the story was really all about the white protagonist's redemption, right? And so the black character becomes sort of like the secondary person that's re- So the movie ends up being about um, uh, the white guy. Then you reverse it to the black Klansman. And, and there's trouble actually even with... Um, the the historical part of that right um uh so people were troubled but but they got over it at least you know uh white folks got over it because it made you feel good at the end right like oh you know isn't this you know relationship between an african-american and a white guy like re- re- possible or redemptive great it's historically flawed then you go to black klansmen and the same people that love that movie almost hate it because it's not historically accurate perfectly uh. Um, but this is Spike Lee, right, telling this story um, of uh, it based on a true story of a, a black guy that is, uh, works uh, for the police. I think the first African-American police officer in Colorado Springs, uh, my hometown, actually. And uh, he he get he joins the Klan um, and infiltrates it. And he does it over the phone. They don't know he's black and then has to send like a proxy. It's 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 really great. Um, and, and the part of the problem is, so Spike Lee, uh, does all this stuff and right before he, uh, finishes it, uh, Charlottesville happens. 
Oh. And so he, he puts a coda on this film with raw, real footage from Charlottesville, right? Oh my God. And so it starts, yeah, it starts, it's, I think, a really powerful movie. But again, um, it's troubling our sensibilities in really important ways um, because this gets back to, I think, Jesus' word to us all, right? He who, or, I've been given you eyes, but you cannot see. I've given you ears, but you cannot hear. He who has eyes to see will see. This is the sort of thing, I think, mm. if we think about, God may be up to something in these films. Yeah. Um, it's it's really hard for us to see it um, unless it's it's shaking us, um, it's unsettling us. And this another movie uh, reference. I I often think of. Uh, are you familiar with the Matrix? So the new yeah. Yeah. the new Matrix is going to come out here in December. I'm I'm both terrified and excited because um, outside of Star Wars, uh, which was the first time that movie sort of captivated me. Huh. Um, Matrix is what was the first movie that I think I saw the theological possibilities. Okay. Um, I was a youth pastor at the time. You know, I, I took my uh, students in the youth ministry to see it. We all, you know, talked about it and stuff. Um, but it also, like, gave me a new framework for, like, thinking about reality, you know. Um, and so, but what I love the line in there where, if you remember, um, the first time Neo comes out of the Matrix, mm-hmm. Um, Morpheus sort of wakes him up and it's, it's all sort of like blurry and Neo goes, why do my eyes hurt? And Morpheus goes, because you've never used them you've before. You've never used them before. Um, yeah. And that's the, I'm constantly thinking of that as a, as a Christian going, I'm looking at black Klansmen and there are moments where I'm like, oh, Spike Lee, this is making my eyes hurt. And it may be because I've actually never used them before. Wow. Um, mm. not, not because this film is flawed or wrong or bad. Um, but I've, I've not trained my eyes to see. Wow. So. Well, what about Joker? That's that's one that I really got into. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to read so, too much into I'm, it. There's so many tiny yeah. details that I'm like, I need yeah. to pause it and just sit there. and. Yeah. Um, well, and that's one thing I... Uh, so I'm going to do what I... Not what I teach, but <laughs> so I'm going to do the opposite. And, um, and usually it's to say, <clears throat> you got to watch these movies more than once. Um, so yeah. one viewing, it's it's hard to know. So I've only seen it once. Um, okay. And it was okay. when it came out in the, in the theater. So... From what I recall, um, I mean, I'm, I'm Team Batman, um, so I, I that he was always my superhero. Um, I'm fine with Superman, but I'm like, I theoretically could be Batman. All I need is like my parents to be murdered, <laughs> and then some, yeah. a, a lot of wealth. Yeah. But in theory, this yeah. could happen. And crazy um, ninja skills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, intense time of training. Um, but <clears throat> what I thought was powerful about the Joker is similar to. Well, any of these other sort of horror shows we're talking about where it it makes the audience complicit in in what it's huh. showing you. So and yeah. I, I my read of that film is, you know, again, it, it was a little on the nose at times with the mental health thing. But I think that's what it's essentially about of going like um, Joker's no longer this like talk about binaries. It's like the evil scapegoat for all that's bad and wrong in the world. You know, the Joker is actually the product of us. Yeah. Um, this is, this is us. And, and, you know, you see him losing his health care and you see him, you know, being derided, you know, all these sort of things. Um, that's a, he is a manifestation of all of, of our societal issues. And it's, it's, it's not enough for us to just go, Joker is evil and we are good. Um, it's inviting us to go, we actually are a part of his yeah. own, um, pathologies, et cetera. And, and I think a really a, a interesting way to say, we need to think more about mental health. Um, yeah. And specifically, I think the church does. But Well, that line at the end, like, toward the end, before he shot Robert De Niro, I forget the actor, or I forget the role he is playing. You know, what do you get when you cross? What do you say? A mentally troubled person with a society that doesn't give a darn. You get what you yeah. have and deserve or something like that. Like it's, And that's kind of the climactic. I feel like that's where it, Yeah. right? I mean, it seems to be kind of like the main point. Oh, yeah. Well, I, little subtle things that I, liked liked is probably not the best word but just uh the slow callousness to evil and just showing yep. in great details how that works out and i feel like there's like three or four dancing scenes that that really manifest that like his first time he's dancing he's kind of out of sync he's goofy it's whatever and then it gets better and better till the very end he's got this very elegant smooth dancing it's almost like He's nice. not troubled by the evil he's becoming. He is 
I, and I, again, yeah. I don't know if I'm reading into it. It just seems like it seems like the movie's so thoughtful. It's like I don't. Well, <laughs> nothing's accidental. Yeah, like they don't. You know, they spend tons of time intentionally placing all these things in there. Um, you know, Joaquin Phoenix is a yeah. uh, a really great actor, so he's thinking through exactly yeah. that. So that's not accidental. Um, I, I again, I only saw it once. So I need to go back. That's a really interesting take. Um, and thinking through how do you how do you like like in a sense he does sort of come alive right yeah. like he's it's clunky and stuff and then he's finally like i've arrived at this thing yeah um and it's it's not to be celebrated but at the same time you see that progression um and yeah that, that'd be a really interesting way just to read the film of his sort of dance vignettes of yeah. what, what's happened at each moment um at each turn that has allowed him to to learn to become habituated in this um to the point that who he is is real that is really him um but again as a product of yeah of, I, I, I mean, when i watch the movie I, I see a glimpse of joker in myself and in, i would think yeah. all of us like it's just like and that's why i'm always disturbed i've watched it like three times and i've just like i feel like i needed it it's spiritually it is so weird i've never thought through it like this but it's, it's like spiritually good for me to watch it and yet i also feel i don't mm -hmm. feel good after i feel disturbed nope. and i feel almost yeah. like okay what where in my life does Joker need to be kind of addressed, you know? Um, hey friends, hope you're enjoying the conversation so far. And if you are enjoying this conversation and others like it, would you consider supporting the Theology in the Raw ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw. You can support the show for as little as five bucks a month and get access to lots of different kinds of premium content like monthly Patreon only podcasts and blogs and Q&A sessions. Again, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Theology in the Raw or all the info is in the show notes where in my life does joker need to be kind of addressed you know um i don't know listen you want me to i again i don't know if you want to hear any of this but <laughs> <laughs> that's that is the the i think a key indicator of uh god moving in the world is disruption hmm. um we a lot of times uh our staid sensibilities wants to say god is is very sort of like careful and sort of precious moments and, uh, you know, a gentle, and, and God is that, and pretty, right? Like it's, it's a very pretty thing. Um, and you go, the, the, huh, the most meaningful and concrete action in all of reality that God took is a very ugly moment that is profoundly disturbing. Mm. Um, you have the cross, right? Like this is uh, the horror of human society writ large. You know, we should stare at that and be troubled by it. And when we when we stare at that and aren't, well, we've become a bit calloused to it. Um, which is why, you know, uh, Joker is a good way to sort of uh, short circuit the process. Yeah. But that's one example. But the, but the other is if we think about God's spirit, um, and I stole this from a guy named Jean-Luc Marion, who wrote a book called God Without Being. Hmm. Um, but you have in, in the biblical witness, um, you have a lot of, uh, of language of the spirit um, and especially the Old Testament, it's God's Ruach, um, which really is, it's not spirit like a ghost. It's its wind or breath. Mm -hmm. um, it's the animating force behind all of life. Um, and then you get this notion of the, the human person. Sometimes Ruach is used to talk about the human, but very not often. Actually, more often, it's this term Hevel. Hmm. And Hevel is the word that is repeated over and over and over again in Ecclesiastes which is actually translated most often as meaninglessness or vanity. Oh, right. That's oh, a terrible, yeah. Yeah, it's a terrible translation. It yeah. actually means uh, wind or, or, I mean, vapor or smoke or mist, right? It's like the, uh, you go out in a cold night and your, your mm -hmm. breath, you know, the, the, you see your breath. And John Marion says, um, uh, there's this interesting moment where uh, the Ruach, the, the breath, the spirit of God comes into contact with a, a lesser spirit to the Hevel, right? A fleeting sort of, we're ephemeral uh, smoke, essentially. Um, well, when that happens, it's not so much that that the human spirit is eradicated or eliminated, but as we know, if you, you know, puff your air out, your, your breath out into the cold night air and the wind comes and sort of moves it up, those air particles aren't gone. They've just been disseminated, right? So, mm -hmm. so I talk about um, human life uh, encountering where Ruach and Hevel meets means we're both 
animated and like um, activated. So those moments of creativity and, and artistry, I think, are the sign of God's spirit in your life. Um, but the sort of decentering, um, the pushing out into places we wouldn't have normally gone is also a way in which we go, oh, God's actually the spirit of God is up to something here. And then disrupting. So all of that is very disruptive <laughs> when we think about what does it mean for us to actually enter into the presence of God's spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and disruption is one of those things that we don't we don't talk about much because we don't like it. I mean, it yeah. doesn't feel good to watch Joker over and over, mm -hmm. um, but it's incredibly important because otherwise you just get hardened and calcified mm -hmm. um, and unable back to talking about movies, unable to see um, what, what it is that God's doing right there in front of you, um, unless you've habituated yourself to go, yeah, sometimes I need to be disrupted. I need yeah. to be unsettled, um, and hopefully have a context that you can navigate that. I mean, it's yeah. could be destructive as well. Right? Yeah, it's, totally. Yeah. That's super helpful. I, I want to, I, I do want to, in a sense, transition, not awkwardly, but actually yes. seamlessly to your book. But I mean, here, here's actually what I think would be helpful is, you know, I just noticed I think all of these movies are like rated R. <laughs> yep. <laughs> lots of swearing, lots of gritty yep. violence, um, uh, Stranger Things, a little horror-ish, yep. Walking Dead, all that. Yep. Um, and and so some – and I, probably not my audience so much, but like some Christians could be like, oh, these are bad movies. We need good movies that don't have swearing, violence, nudity, you know, or maybe Christian movies, you know, um, or not even Christian, but like safe Disney films, you know? <laughs> yep. Um can yeah. you maybe address what do I make of that? <laughs> can you address that way of thinking and I primarily want people to I want to hear you unpack just the danger of like quote unquote clean narr you know stories yeah. where the meaning of the story is actually profoundly yep uh can wreak havoc on your Christ your actual oh, yeah. Christian worldview. Yeah. yeah, that's a great uh question because um I I uh, I become calloused, I guess, or I, I become I've, I've had this conversation so many times. I, I often go like, oh, don't we already know the answer to this? But the <laughs> truth is, no. yeah. it, it does. You're right. It does keep coming up. And I think it is important. I mean, it is an important question um, to the point that a colleague of mine's like, you, you should actually write a short little book just basically answering the question you just asked. I'm like, that could be helpful. I just, you know, a uh, hundred page thing. I'm like, yeah. here's how to think about this. Um, but you're. Your language is important of saying the meaning. So I like to, the main thing I like to do is uh, separate between content and meaning. Okay. Um, and and what that means is it, it's not that you shouldn't care about the content of the movie, the language, and it's usually the big three, language, sex, and violence, right? Yeah. Um, those are important. And of course, discernment is required uh, for everyone. Um, if you, for example, uh, struggle with an addiction to pornography, you should probably avoid movies that are going to sort of be bridges into that again, you know? Right. So, but, but not everyone does. And so that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, as I said earlier, as a former youth pastor, which means if I hung out with high school kids at a high school, uh, I heard more like crazy language that <laughs> would never make it into a rated R movie <laughs> than you could possibly imagine. So, you know, watching movies is is like child's play compared to just hanging out at a public high school with high school kids, right? So, uh, it does it affect me? I suppose, but only in the sense that it allows me to inhabit their world. Um, you, real but, quick, I would just, just real quick, yeah. cause my kids and I have this conversation. Like, yeah. do you ever feel like there's a place to where it does motivate, desensitize you in the sense of you just start kind of absorbing that way of you know? Um, Yes. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Um, and I've shifted now again, uh, as a parenting thing, it's a little different. I'm, I'm talking here almost exclusively as adults. Okay. Um, okay. once it comes to kids, I do think it changes. Um, okay. and there's developmental moments. Um, th there's again, kid to kid, you know, like everyone has different sensibilities. Um, I've just personally never, I've never been a big cursor. Uh, mm. my, I tend to just use words. Nobody knows. <laughs> so, <laughs> When I get angry, I, you know, a, a trail of like, yeah. uh, words backwards, come. but, um, like if you, if you watch so a movie with tons me, of swearing, you're not like motivated to go swear. I mean, or it doesn't like, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> no, I, for me, it, it usually happens more in like relational contexts. Okay. I mean, I worked for a, an engineering company for a number of years and, uh, most of them were ex-military and whoo, uh, they, there's a lot of swearing to the point that like to even refer to things, 
the thing, the items had swear words built into them. And like, it was hard to even like, so anyway, it, you get my point. Um, but so if we're talking just about adults, parenting is, is a different thing. Okay. And I'm, I'm guarded with my kids in terms of both the content and the kinds of things they watch. Okay. Um, but, but I do separate those things out as we're going to think about the artistry of these films is, um, is there something that it's contributing to the larger meaning? There are always examples where it's just like useless. It's just frivolous or gratuitous violence or sex or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I generally have to say in an American context, remind people that violence is bad too. <laughs> um, we, we tend to write that off as if it's just no biggie, but you show a boob and ah, you know, like, yeah. Um, so um, separating out content and meaning is one thing, but to the uh, point of, of becoming calloused, um, I, I, I take students every year, well, hopefully again this year if it comes back, um, to the Sundance Film Festival. Oh, yeah. Um, these are all indie films. They're not even rated at all, which means they're at probably at least R-rated, if not worse, most of the time. Um, very gritty, difficult content about a lot of really important things. Um, and I had one woman who went a number of years ago, and she, uh, a little while later, said, Cutter, I, you know, it's been a month since Sundance, and I went, and my son, her adult son, invited me to this movie, and we watched it, and I realized before Sundance, I would never have gone. And even if I had, I would not have been able to make it through that movie. But because <laughs> she said something like, because I had, had sort of become calloused at Sundance, I was able to go see this movie, or I was desensitized, right? Desensitized language. And I was able to, and then I had this great conversation with my son about it, and all because I was desensitized from Sundance. And I'm like, <gasps> you're the first person I've ever heard use desensitized in like a positive yeah. way. Huh. So, um, in on one sense, yes. On the other sense, um, yes, and it's bad, but I want to say yes, and it can be good for some people. Um, for some who are called to that, um, who see it as part of um, their obligation, like I tend to watch a bunch to help others go, okay, look, Hot Tub Time Machine 2, probably not worth your effort. Or, you know, like it's it's just, ah, uh, you know. Um, but but I'll go there um, knowing who I am, knowing the sort of practices I've set up, um, because what I'd like to do is uh, find a way, I, the language I use, is to become offended without taking offense. Um, to be able to inhabit mm. realms where I can acknowledge offensive content um, that you know, troubles my religious sensibilities or political or whatever, and yet doesn't take offense so that I can be all things to all people, right? I mean, that's sort of the, that's mm -hmm. the goal. Um, so I do think in some realms, desensitization is good. Okay, mm -hmm. now shift to meaning, and it's exactly your point, the segue is <clears throat> what we miss in that content uh, criticism of like how many F-bombs are there, you know, how much nudity, et cetera, is we miss the larger meaning of these narratives. And that I think is far more powerful, especially over time than anything else. And that's why in my book, I talk about Disney narratives because specifically within the sort of Christian evangelical subculture, Disney princesses have been elevated <laughs> in in my ways, in my mind, mind-boggling ways, yeah. um, because the assumption is these are like safe kid and family-friendly films. And I'm like, well, they may be thematically, but at the same time, what they mean to me is like incredibly contrary to the vision that um, that God, that Jesus has given us, both as individuals and um, as a community. And then specifically as it concerns relationships, right? Romantic partnering and, and marriage. Um, and I'm like, these are incredibly damaging for our daughters, uh, for our sons, for for community. Can you go into detail? That? Can you can you get like go dive deeper into that? Like in case people want to know exactly. Community? Yeah, with like a specific or, Disney or, film or like yeah. Yeah. So um, if you look and in, and in, in the book, I, I I basically break down every princess film and and categorize them into different sort of eras. And again, Disney has has shifted and changed, but some of the more iconic princesses, um, you know, it, it's, I mean, they're pretty crazy by modern terms. I mean, you have um, women that are literally have no point or meaning or purpose in life outside of um, finding a soulmate, um, finding their prince charming. Uh, often that uh, that young woman who's borderline like adolescent i mean they look if you go back and watch some of these early i mean they look like they're 12 and 13 it's crazy um often you know you think of snow white she's she's literally unconscious 
and a man has to kiss her <laughs> to awaken her, and then they live happily ever after, right? Like, um, so this is literally no consent, um, you know, I, and I'm overstating it a bit, but but to make a point, and that is um, you have these visions of, of specifically women who um, are only complete or filled after a generic man, and even they come in from nowhere, and we don't know much about them. Um, and then together, this coupling sort of uh, emerges into just a generic hap happiness, um, mm -hmm. which we know nothing about, you know, um, you then shift to some later Disney films and, um, uh, they try to sort of play with this. Um, so you get into the, the sort of nineties era where there was the Renaissance of, um, mm -hmm. uh, or the, the reintroduction of Disney. They came back with beauty and the beast and, and little mermaid and Lion well, lion King's not really a princess, but it sort of is. Um, and, uh, and each of these narratives now, once again, even though they're trying to push the trope of, for example, Belle and Beauty and the Beast being very sort of independent, she's a reader. Um, mm. but the book she reads is about romance. Um, the, the, the narrative that she is a part is about her finding true love, whatever that is. Um, and that, that true love is changing another person, whatever, from literally not a human into a human. And so you get this thing where the the beast um, becomes human when he's able to romantically couple with somebody. Uh, <laughs> the same thing happens in Little Mermaid. She literally cannot be human. And when she can, it's, it's uh, sort of um, stamped as a marriage, right? Like everyone says, this is what happens. You get married and you be, you're no longer a, a half human. You're now fully human. So you get all these visions um, within there of we are radically incomplete individuals who need a, a, another to complete us, known as a soulmate. Um, once we do that, we have arrived at some state that is ultimate um, beyond which we don't see. And part of that has to do with us becoming fully human. Um, not, not, a, not the best biblical theology of singleness. Is no, it? <laughs> every single one of those points is deeply theologically flawed. Um, and, and, uh, it's yet because of, I think our, um, our, uh, trouble with sexuality. And I think this is the underlying thing in, in American Christianity. And I can even, I'll just speak for my generation. I was born in 79, the greatest year. <laughs> um, and so right when sort of the, um, a lot of these things shifted within our subculture that skewed towards some like hot button issues. Um, and one of these had to do with sexuality. And so I grew up in a church culture that elevated this sense of, of purity. Right. Yeah. Um, and it became a thing where you go marriage now is, where you dump all of your sexual anxiety and your sexual needs and everything that's going on, we're not going to talk about it right now. Um, <laughs> just wait, and it'll all fix itself, right? right. Um, and and so I think that's a reflection of like a deep sort of, um, uh, uh, not uncertainty, um, what would the word be? We're unsettled. We're yeah. uh, anxious about talking about sexuality. What does it mean to steward sexuality? as people who are not married. Um, and that was never handed to me. Nobody ever gave me those sort of resources. Mm -hmm. And so when you get these princess films and Disney films that essentially carve out narratives where it's just, but we don't talk about it, we wait, you're kissed, mm -hmm. and now everything's great. Um, that was like a perfect kind of narrative mm -hmm. um, to address the anxieties that I think a lot of uh, parents, and again, uh, it's very hard being a parent, we're both parents. We get it. Yeah. Um, but especially parents that were Christians were trying to figure out, like, what do I do with an increasingly sexualized society that my kids are living in? Hmm. How do I navigate my own Christian faith? Um, and then all of these sort of resources came out that were riffing on these princess narratives uh, that were very convenient and easy. Um, and uh, here you go, kids. Here's how to steward your sexuality, which is don't talk about it until mm. marriage. And now we have a whole generation of people that are married or now divorced in part because they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Right. Um, and, false false uh, promises. Yeah. and yeah. yeah. False promises or just, yeah, still the same problems that they're struggling with before marriage. Mm -hmm. They weren't solved and shock and awe. They're still dealing with them after marriage. Yeah. Um, yeah. and the marriage didn't solve it. So 
and and you know the I don't want to harp on I won't name names, but a very recent person who wrote a very influential book along these lines who um, uh, I've met with and talked to a great guy. Um, I have a lot of respect for him, but I, I do, I mourn the fact that uh, he now is um, not in his marriage and not any longer identify as a part of the Christian faith. Um, and so you see uh, the tragedy of this isn't just people's marriages collapsing or whatever. Um, but, but some of that was bound up in what it even meant to be a Christian. Hmm. And so once all of that sort of unravels, I've seen a number of these narratives where those people also are, are leaving the faith because they can't separate it out. It's all a, a part of that, of a whole essentially. Um, so, so that's so, so when the marriage deconstructs yeah. because the marriage yeah. was so built into the Christian narrative that it's all just intertwined. The whole thing comes apart. Yeah. And that, that's my sort of psychoanalysis of it. Um, yeah. So, um, but I've I've seen a similar pattern there so many times that it make it that's what it makes me wonder. I'm like, huh? I I've often seen that like, uh oh, I was handed a raw deal. I I didn't understand what <laughs> I was being sold. Mm-hmm. It was a bill of goods, um, and then um, I I can't be a part of this marriage for any number of reasons. And then soon after that, mm-hmm. I'm now no longer part of the faith either. Yeah. Um, so that that pattern I've seen in multiple different people's lives, and I go, huh, there must be something to it. Yeah. And not, it's not I'm not saying that any of those individuals would have also described yeah, it that yeah. way. So, I, so I got a clear. question I just I didn't have before. I just thought of it as you're talking with regard to like Disney films and kind of the yeah the idolatry of marriage, or at least the um, just a certain narrative that has marriage as the focal point, kind of the almost like a messianic you know, mm-hmm. um, role, um, yeah. is that, um, do you think those narratives, which are so popular in Disney films and rom-coms and just yeah. mi- many movies that have a romantic theme are just very predictable. Um, do you think those are creating a certain idolatry in marriage or do you think they are, is it consumer driven? Are they created and they know they're going to sell well because people already have that? I would imagine it's probably a dialectic between the two, but yeah, have you thought through like cause and effect here, consumer and creator? And yeah, um, gen- generally, I think I mean, you know, you know, there's no perfect answer, but generally, I think it is both. I think it's what you're saying. It's it's both a, uh, um, you know, we talk in cultural studies of, of models and mirrors, so it's both okay. it both uh, models something for us. In other words, it's it's sort of teaching and training us in a certain way, forming us. But it also it's just mirroring back to us what we already okay. are. Yeah. Um, and so in that sense, uh, yeah, when we go and, and consume these narratives, uh, it I, I think it's a bit of both because, again, um, Hollywood or anybody it's, with the economics, they're not going to make it if nobody watches it. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. my youngest actually asked me, are they going to make a Frozen 3? And I'm like, well, would you go watch a Frozen 3? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, then they'll probably make it. Um, you know, <laughs> or I think it was Mike Myers, right? He, How many Austin Powers did he do? And they said, when are you going to stop making Austin Powers? Uh, and he's like, when they stop watching, right? <laughs> so yeah, I do think it's both. Um, but that is where it is. Um, it's important for it, back to sort of our first part of our conversation of why I find it important to train ourselves. And most of what I teach is becoming better interpreters of culture Mm -hmm. and better interpreters just general of our own texts and narratives. Um, And that includes like the biblical text, but also these narratives we're we're telling without any words, right? So Mm -hmm. the, the way we organize our, um, our communities, um, the way, the way our website reads, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can learn a lot about an organization based upon how their websites organized Mm -hmm. Um, and, Mm -hmm. or if they even use a website, if they're only on Twitter or something, you know, I don't know. (laughs) Um, and, and it says a lot without speaking a word about who's important, who's central, who's not, um, which voices are allowed in, which voices, um, aren't allowed. Um, and a lot is communicated in those different ways that we need to be better interpreters of, of our own texts and narratives so that then we can get to a place and go, okay, now when we've got this film, let's say it's a rom-com giving us a certain vision of, of romance and life and marriage, single or not, um, we've got to actually understand what it's doing. And then we've also got to understand what we're doing if we're going to sort of interface, if we're going to be able to go, yeah, I mean, again, it's a movie. Yeah. Can't make too much of it. Um, but if, if we're going to endorse it or embrace it or think more about it, um, 
we've got to be able to understand it and interpret it well, uh, as opposed to uh, just unthinkingly endorse yeah. it. And then all of, because all of a sudden you start, again, crafting similar narratives with a sort of Christian veneer. Yeah. And I'm looking at it going, these are the same thing. You, yeah. you know, you're. Yeah. you're this is, you're, you're just a romantic comedy, but with starring Jesus or something like right. that. Um, <laughs> Hello, friends. I wanted to let you know about an opportunity to engage the conversation about faith, sexuality, and gender. On October 20th through 21st, here in Boise, Idaho, we're going to ha be having a conference on faith, sexuality, and gender. On the evening of the 20th, we're going to have a two and a half hour introduction for those of you who just need to get your arms around the topic. And the next day, October 21st, we're going to have an all day conference where we're going to dig into a lot of aspects of this really important conversation. You can join us live here in Boise, or you can stream it online. And uh, I would highly encourage you to come out if you can make it, but I know that can be expensive or just not possible. So um, please consider joining us at least uh, through the live stream option on October 20th or October 21st. All the info is on the website, centerforfaith.com uh, forward slash events. That's centerforfaith.com forward slash events. You're just a romantic comedy, but with starring Jesus or something like right. that. Um, <laughs> well, and th this is going back to the swearing thing. Like, like I, I can, or even, I don't know, all the kind of the big three. Yeah. Uh, I, I can watch a movie. We can pick any one of these, you know, Get Out, Gran Torino, Joe, whatever that has a lot of swearing. And I'm not, it doesn't affect, it doesn't do anything negative to me. In fact, I would almost say, let's just say Gran Torino. It has a lot of gang scenes and stuff and. It would be dishonest if there wasn't a lot of swearing when a bunch of gang members were around or it wasn't much like even misogyny. And there's some scenes that are yeah. like, wow, that, you know, it's like, well, that's just honest with real life. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't absorb any of that. I, I don't know too many people that would really heavily absorb that. Um, but you absorb these subtle narratives. I mean, they're subtle in the sense that a lot of stuff people maybe didn't yeah. realize like, oh, yeah, I told this Disney film yeah. is. <laughs> horrendous in terms of how you know but we do absorb that right like that actually yeah. does affect us there's a couple in between categories for me um ve vengeful violence mm -hmm. that you know and i'm i'm a pacifist or non-violent advocate and i still even though that's my worldview um man something ignites in me when you watch a mm -hmm. film that just really does not yeah. just contain vengeful violence but it, it where they frame it in a way that makes you feel so good that the enemy got what they deserved you know and that's where i'm like ah is that good for me to you know gladiator or whatever some of my favorite movies it's like when i watch them i'm like why am i rooting for this guy to destroy his yeah. enemy and i get this euphoric feeling you know um yeah. so that that is one where i'm like yeah. I, I wonder if i am absorbing things there that i shouldn't be i don't know um I think you're right. I mean, that gets back again to the the meaning part of it. Yeah. I think is more important or or formative or impactful than some of the the details of content. Um, and what you're getting at, I think, is is more the narrative side of things. Like, what is the story doing? How is it affecting me? Mm -hmm. uh, where does it land overall? Mm -hmm. And um, and that's where there's narratives are very powerful, right? They have a lot of of, of power because of the way they uh, engage our imaginations. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that the content is not a part of it, but it usually is about whether or not it takes you in, in or out of the story. Right. So, mm. uh, you know, if you saw saving private Ryan yeah. and nobody was cursing, you'd be like, <laughs> no, I like, I can't, my, I don't believe it. Right. So that's one of the mm. things you would check. Out. Um, uh, or, or Schindler's list, right? Like this is a, I remember I was in high school. I was a senior in high school when Schindler's list came out. And, and we went and saw it, it was assigned. Um, and I had to get special permission because it was rated R and I, I was still 17 or, well, maybe I, maybe I didn't, maybe I was a junior. Anyway, um, powerful, powerful yeah. movie. Um, I think, right, that it should be watched by <laughs> everyone. Um, but the content in there is brutal, right? Yeah. So to your point, yeah, I think um, it's like the, you know, let's say it's the alcoholic going to a bar. If you struggle with like, vengeful fantasies hmm. i think that's a good discernment criteria to go you know what it's may not, maybe not healthy for me to watch movies that glorify that you could then take another step and go is it good for christians at all to watch and 
maybe not watch them, but to endorse or, you know, be enthusiastically embraced of them. Um, and, and I, back to your Braveheart point, it's like one of the most, uh, the times that I've felt most out of touch with men's ministry in a church. Uh, and I've never felt like a real man in <laughs> Christian subcultures for this kind of reason. Um, I was uh, newly on staff at this pretty large church. Um, and we went on the first men's retreat and I was required to go. And normally I don't go on men's retreats because I don't, I don't feel all that connected to, to grunt and eat meats. Although I do like meat. I, I love meat. <laughs> but, um, and we get up and so they got all the pastors up on in the first night and it was sort of like a panel Q and a, and it's like, okay, introduce yourself. And they said, go around so here are what ministry you're at and, you know, what your favorite guy movie is, you know. And so, of course, everyone's like, I love Gladiator. I love Braveheart. I love, you know, Die Hard. So, so, so <laughs> you're like Frozen too. <laughs> well, Frozen wasn't out yet, but I probably would have said that. Um, no, I at the time, and I still wish it was my favorite, but it's not, um, uh, was American Beauty. Um, and I said, uh, I, did you ever see that? Is no. that one ring a bell? Um, no, Cutter, I'm a real man. I don't, I don't watch. Yeah, you know. you're a real man. Well, I did. So this is what I said. I, I, in a sort of punk move, I go, well, I don't watch guy movies. I watch film. Um, <laughs> and I said, my, my favorite film is called American Beauty um, by Sam Mendes. And anyway, um, and the, the guy, the other, my pastoral colleague who was sort of emceeing it goes, um, and he says this on the mic, it's like 300 guys in this auditorium. And he's like, uh, you might want to pick a different movie because I, I think you just alienated your whole audience. And I was like, uh, oh, I, I guess I like Gladiator. You know, like, so I was forced to not not only endorse or or uh, sort of align with this vision of masculinity, but that vision of masculinity was directly bound up with these film narratives hmm. that are redemptive violence and. And, you know, anybody can go, well, but that's just one case, whatever. Well, then, and this is where I get in my book, um, I basically, the hardest part of writing that book on marriage was um, going and actually naming names. Of I have to show you, Christian community, here are the leading voices in prominent places where we are doing this and we're calling it theology. And so I name a specific author who I won't on the podcast. If you want to go read the book, you can see it. Um, a specific handful of authors who who write Bible studies and Bible commentaries using Disney princess categories who say we need to be William Wallace's, not mm. Mother Teresa's. And I remember reading those lines going, what? Like, that's when, insane. Wow. Yeah. What what Jesus are you following that you say the image that I need to have in mind as a disciple is William Wallace and not the weak, feeble Mother Teresa, as if he's spitting her name out of his mouth. I mean, I just, this is shocking, but that's that's how influential it becomes, where we we embrace these narratives to the point that now we're explicitly advocating for them, when to me, it, it's just, and you're, you're naming, you know, one of a modern saint, I mean, literally a modern saint, as what you shouldn't be, Christian men, you should be William Wallace. Um, so to your point, I think that's, yes. It's exactly right um, that it shapes us, those narratives, more so than the violence or the sexuality. It's where does the trajectory of that narrative go um, and how does it uh, engage yeah. our imaginations? Cutter, we're, we're over an hour. Uh, I just yeah. checked the time. I, I, I thought it's been like 10 minutes, but um, I want to I want to I, I we haven't. I mean, I, I mentioned at the beginning, but the book Breaking the Marriage Idol, Reconstructing yeah. Our Cultural and Spiritual Norms. This book is absolutely outstanding. And um, I. <laughs> What is it? IVP. IVP did not pay me to say this. Okay. But you know, like I, I picked up this book, I think because my buddy Greg Coles endorsed it yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, no, you know what? Yeah. He told me about it before it even came out. And so right when it came out, I think yeah. I, it was one of those where yeah. I pre-ordered it and I was like, this book is golden. So I would encourage everybody seriously read this book. It's outstanding. So, um, thanks so much, man, for the conversation. Yeah. I, this is, oh man, I, yeah, well, I gotta have you back uh, on because we have really, a lot more to talk about. But <laughs> obviously, I'm a I'm a talker and out loud processor, so it's it's my fault, not yours, that the ten minutes went long. Um, oh, not at all. No, I, I don't have a time limit, so I'm just worried about but, your time. But oh no, I, I'm fine. I mean, okay. the the interesting thing, I think I put a little snarky thing in your uh, uh you know sign up for scheduling oh. for when you talk, and you know like what are we gonna talk about? I'm like, well, I guess you want me to talk about this book. Came out a couple years ago, or maybe a few. I can't uh, twenty. 
17 or 18. I can't actually remember the official date. 2018. Um, 2018. Okay. Yeah. So now it's been three ish years. And um, uh, what's interesting to me about it now is now I'm seeing like this year, and I think the pandemic actually affected this. I think the pandemic affected uh, single folks and married yeah. folks much, much differently. Not even I think, I know it did. Yeah. Um, and so I think this is part of what's animating it. But all of a sudden you see all these sort of like Christian outlets, these articles out there of like, how come nobody's talking about X or why didn't we talk about? And I'm like, and it's about singleness and sexuality and marriage and blah, blah, blah. blah. And I'm like, uh, I had to quit doing it. Like, um, I had friends who wrote in the book, you know, little vignettes and they, they will helpfully like post responses like, Hey, relevant. Have you seen this book? <laughs> like huh. you're, you know, so, um, so I do think I, I wished it was more engaged when it first came out. Um, you always do as an author, yeah. but I hope it's a slow burn. Like I hope it's something that, doesn't it's it's sort of an evergreen thing it needs to change and develop over time but the core kind of questions it's raising for us i think i think will have a longer effect than most of my other books um yeah. simply because it's it's not going away in terms of what we what we need to think about it is a very timely i mean obviously you use examples of certain films that are you know whatever but even i mean disney films and taylor swift like you know for, for the next 10 years these are going to be very relevant and even yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the, but the content is, uh, yeah, it's timeless. And it's just, it really, I mean, it really is, I think, the best book out there on this topic that I've, that I've read. Not that I've read them all, but uh, I, I mean, in my, when I, when I speak and I do address singleness and uh, masculinity and femininity, in fact, you're, it's funny, you're, <laughs> your men's ministry illustration, I've used that kind of scenario like as a fictitious thing. <laughs> you almost, <laughs> you know, I, as an example of, you, you know, yeah. we absorb cultural stereotypes when you go to a men's or women's retreat and I'll give examples, you know, and, but it's, 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 they're not theoretical and they do ostracize. I mean, I, I use it in the context of like a lot of gay and lesbian people feel and trans people feel very much, you know, like, Oh, I would never go to one of those, you know, but I usually get amens from about 30% of the straight people in the room, you know, women that are like, look, I'm straight, whatever. Um, but I like barbecue and I want to play pickup basketball, not just do huh. knitting, you know? And, um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you for this book and everything you're doing, bro. Can I, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a pitch to you here too, along those lines and we can wrap too. Sure. Uh, so, cause I saw you have a conference coming up. Yeah. Uh, you're organizing on, uh, what is it? Eg exiles? Is it exiles? Oh yeah. The theology and raw exiles in Babylon conference. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm about to potentially disrupt your entire conference theme. Okay. But it's along these lines, okay? So it's just my <laughs> food for thought as yes. we leave. And I'm happy if you want me to come and be a disruptive uh, speaker on the panel. I'm happy to do it. Okay. But it would just be why we can't use this theme anymore. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but I say that it, it, like seriously and, and um, only because um, I have used that language a lot um, as well for years. I'm like, I feel like that's a really good way to think about engagement with culture and all this other stuff of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the Jeremiah passage of, of seeking the welfare of the city you're in, et cetera, et cetera. The problem I've, and this gets to the narrative question that you were asking earlier, both film and then our own biblical text of the reason why we need to be able, better interpreters of narratives is I think where we identify, right? And here's my take on uh, the bulk of American evangelical Christians, especially those who are like me, white, cisgendered, straight males, yeah, yeah. right? Um, if you don't fall on those lines, this isn't exactly for you, but we all have different, you know, uh, privileges in our different intersections. So just take this for what it's worth. But I've been thinking more about it. And exile um, can be helpful, but it's not actually quite where we're at in the U.S. right now, because as I see it, we are actually not exiles from Babylon. We're Israel at the height of its gluttonous worst. We're in charge of everything. Uh, Christians elect all of our public leaders. <laughs> we enact all the legislation. Um, still, there's like 75% of the U.S. population says they're Christian, you know, whatever that means, but yeah. they say they are. All of our holidays are Christian. Huh. We get uh, tax relief. We get, I mean, like, we have freedom of religious expression, so forth and so on. And I go, what are we exiled from? Hmm. And I think part of at least, and so this is my new, this is new thinking. That's why when I saw your um, <laughs> uh, conference, it sparked me. And I go, I think what we need to think of is we are actually in power and back to that prophecy thing of our worship stinks in the nostrils of God. 
And the prophets are coming saying, the end is coming. You need to repent and reform. And we're not listening to them. So what would it look like to shift the way we think about culture from I'm an exile towards those in power to I'm actually in power. And if I don't change the way I steward that power, uh, we're done for. Okay. That's that's that that uh, that would take a whole nother. Yeah, I got I do have some half baked thoughts about that. I, 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 I wonder if we're kind of saying the same thing, although I would need to really think because I, the, the theme of exiles in Babylon is trying to accomplish. I think what you're yes. nervous yeah. about. Yeah. Cause like I, in my, in my world, people don't see themselves as exiles in Babylon. They think it's a Christianized Babylon or that, you know, it, it's, it's ah, just yes. that like they, yeah. they ah. see themselves as losing power. And what's the response is to yes. get back into power. Get back into and power. I'm like, yeah. no power is not the game here. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I, that's an interesting take. I, I, yeah, yeah I, th- I think we might well, be, I, I do think it probably has to do with who your audience is, like right, yeah. who, where they're at. So that's of course very important, but, um, in my realm, some of the exiles, it's too quickly like um, it's always a, a, a us against them. Like we we're these sort of like uh, disadvantaged few. And I'm like, wait, you have all oh. all the privilege and power in the world. Why are you feeling like you're exiled? Right? OK, Why yeah, you... that's 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 I I very much hear you. And, and yeah, my my interesting. My, so you're saying oh, that's good. It mine's the opposite. Mine. It would be like um one of my things I'm deeply concerned with virtually every single pastor that I talk to says my church is so divided over Mm -hmm. political, not partisan type issues. They can't even, they can't even sit next to somebody if they are Republican or or maybe even Democrat or whatever. And I'm like, wait, Jesus isn't enough. (laughs) So, so I feel like their identity and allegiances are so wrapped up into Babylon that I'm trying to see us as let's, let's, push back from that okay. if your church yeah, yeah. 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 all right yeah. all right i'm with you never mind it's it's I, not I, it's I, not the religious right kind of we're the persecuted it's not that at all uh that's not my audience for the most part i, I lost that audience <laughs> a when i became time. a pacifist actually <laughs> yeah yeah see that's that's the thing you, there's a handful of things pacifism issues of sexuality yeah. and the other abortion i mean these sort of three right. things um man and that's why that Tammy Faye movie is very prophetic because yeah. th- these are actually new new things. Okay, we can keep talking forever, but um, yeah. uh, love your work and you. uh, love what you're doing. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Cutter. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right. Take yeah. care, man.